And this is a, a shortened version of a very simple talk about uh, stars and planets and what, what they are and a few sort of very fundamental aspects. So stars shine by their own light because they are hot. They're releasing energy from their cores where they're converting hydrogen, the most common element in the universe, to helium. And planets, on the other hand, do not shine by their own light. We can only see them because they reflect the light from the sun or their parent star, if they orbit a different star. And um, they are only kept warm by the heat from that parent star, our, our star being the sun. The sun is a very ordinary star. In fact, it's on the small side, as we shall see. Uh, now, planet means wanderer for, in Greek and literally just meant anything that moved across the sky and was visible. So to the ancient Greeks, the moon and the sun were also deemed planets, along with the uh, major planets that they knew about, which was Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. There's loads of people joining in now. I knew that would happen. I'll let them in. I can see them, Paul, so I'll let them in while you're Are talking. Are you dealing with it, Jonathan? That's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, third class of object we have is moons and moons orbit around planets and so obviously we have our own moon uh, Mars has moons and so forth and then there are various smaller members of the solar system which we shall come up onto and talk about separately so when we look up in the night sky we see lots of lights up there most of them are stars and we see that they are different brightnesses and different colours. And so just a brief introduction as to why they are different brightnesses and different colours even. The colour relates to how hot they are. So things begin to glow when you heat them up to about 3000 degrees, they become red hot. If you heat an iron bar, it'll glow red, keep going, it'll go orange, then yellow, then white, and then it'll probably melt but stars can become hotter even than that, and they go from white hot to blue hot. So the temperature very much uh, is a, a flag to, as to the color for stars, and it's usually an indication of their mass as well, because for ordinary stars, the more massive they are, the hotter they burn. So the small red dwarfs at the bottom here, the sun in the middle here is a fairly ordinary yellow star, and then the brighter white and blue stars are the most massive ones. Now the reason that they look different brightnesses can either be because they are more or less powerful in, in themselves or it can be that they are uh, at different distances. So bright ones are either nearby or very powerful and further away. Faint ones are either not very bright or just a very long way indeed. And it would be very helpful for us to be able to classify them if we actually were able to measure the distance, of course. And we'll come on to how we do that later. Of course, there are other confounding factors in this. If there are obscuring clouds of dust in between us and a distant star, it can make it look fainter than it really would be for the distance. But if we classify all the ordinary stars according to their absolute power output, which uh, we plot up the side here, and their colour, which is an indication of temperature, as I've said, then all the ordinary stars fall along this diagonal line here, from the red dwarfs up through the orange, yellow, white and blue stars, getting more massive. You can see the sun here, uh, one unit, one solar mass, these little stars here are a third of a solar mass or a tenth of a solar mass and burn more uh, quietly and less powerfully at a lower temperature. The higher the mass going up here, the faster and hotter they burn. As for sizes, just to give you a relative size of a few things. We've got the inner planets, which we will talk more about tonight here. Mercury, Mars, Venus and the Earth in order of size, small rocky planets. 
But then if we jump scales to box number two and shrink the Earth to this size, you see the four giant gaseous planets, much larger. And again, jump to box three and shrink Jupiter down to a small object here. We've got uh, the first few stars, a little tiny red dwarf called Wolf 359, the sun, rather larger, and the bright star Sirius, the brightest star that we see in the sky apart from our sun. And that's because it's a little bit more powerful, but it's also very close to us. But it's by no means a giant star, because if we pop Sirius down to here and change the scale, we have Pollux, Arcturus and Aldebaran getting progressively larger. And we haven't finished yet because we can carry on into box five and shrink Aldebaran all the way down to here. And then we have Rigel and Betelgeuse, both in Orion and Antares in Scorpio as these absolutely massive stars. And that's not the end. The largest stars are these in, in this uh, box six. We've shrunk Antares down. And so we've got S. Doradus, K.Y. Cygni and V.V. Cephi, one of the largest known stars. Absolutely vast and about 200 times the mass of our sun. Now, I mentioned that uh, what stars do is uh, burn hydrogen in a nuclear fusion process. And this was the cause of uh, much study back in the uh, late 1800s by uh, Lord Kelvin. He asked the question, what powers a star? And he tried to work out what the source of energy might be because he realized that a hot object would cool down over time. Less new energy was being provided all the time as we went along. And he wondered what that source of energy might be. And being a good Victorian scientist, he compared it to steam engines, the powerhouses of the day, and the burning of coal. And he worked out that if the entire uh, sun was made of coal and burning, it would only give enough, uh, only have enough fuel to keep it burning and producing the energy that it does for 3000 years. And he knew that was wrong because even back in Victorian times, they knew that uh, the uh, Chinese history went back further than that. And indeed the uh, dates of the pyramids and so forth. So the age of the earth was um, considerably older than just a few thousand years. Of course, what he didn't know back then, because it wasn't discovered until 1896, was anything about radioactivity and nuclear energy and the power locked in the core in the nucleus of the atom, which is thousands of times more than is available from chemical energy, such as burning of coal. And so stars are giant pressure cookers, which have gravity squeezing the material inwards, the force of gravity increases with the mass of the star, pulling the, the material together. And as the material is squeezed into the center, the temperature goes up, that's what happens when you squash gases. And so you, you get a very, very uh, high temperature right in the center, sufficient to trigger these nuclear processes off. And they release energy, and then that en energy release resists the collapsing force of gravity and puts the star into a more or less stable configuration, so long as the fuel continues to be available to burn. When I say burn, I mean nuclear fusion, and that's depicted in this little diagram here, where we have the simplest element in the universe, one proton, hydrogen nuclei, these red things. We smack two of them together and make a two particle nucleus. One of them is forced to turn into a neutron and uh, that's a heavy version of hydrogen. We add a third particle to make helium three and then we smash two helium threes together to make helium four and get two of our original protons back. So you can see we put in one, two, three, four, five, six protons we get two back, we've used up four, and we end up with a four particle helium nucleus. It's fairly straightforward. And that each stage there releases a little flash of energy. And those flashes of energy add up to the heat released by the star. Now, that's uh, 
Planets are completely different. So they do not generate heat by nuclear fusion. They only get heat from the uh, uh, parent star, or only get light from the parent star. And of course, they orbit around it. The definition of a planet is something that orbits a star and which is not a star itself, because sometimes we can have two stars orbiting each other in a binary system or a more complicated uh, arrangement. And so we're going to hear about the planets, just a few pictures of them for now. Mercury, Venus, about the same size as Earth, covered in clouds. The Earth itself, our Moon and Mars are the inner solar system and are mostly rocky planets. Then we have the asteroid belt, which doesn't look quite like this artist's impression. You could fly through it and not see another space rock they're separated by much greater distances than this gives as an impression. We'll hear about those later. And then we get the outer planets. This is the planet Jupiter with its great red spot. It's actually a photograph that I took with my home observatory here from our Cambridgeshire back garden. I was quite pleased with it. Saturn with its amazing ring systems. The rather bland but nevertheless interesting Uranus and the lovely blue Neptune with the great dark spot imaged by Voyager 2 here. And those are the major planets. But of course, there's Pluto as well. And this is the fabulous photograph taken by the New Horizons space probe that flew past Pluto a few years ago now. Uh, absolutely fantastic resolution. We'll hear more about Pluto, but Pluto got demoted and poor Pluto is no longer a major planet. In 2006, the International Astronomical Unit decided that frankly it was too small and if we let Pluto be a planet, well we were discovering lots of other wandering space rocks in the solar system that really ought to be called planets as well and we'd have dozens of them before long and uh, we really ought to do something about what we meant by planet not just using the Greek word wanderer. We'll also hear about the moons and sometimes the moons of these planets are by far the most interesting. The uh, moons are things that orbit planets, planets are things that orbit stars. We'll hear about comets. This is a fabulous photograph of Comet McNaught from a few years ago with its amazing tail. We'll hear about meteors and Jonathan mentioned while we were chatting that Tonight there is a meteor shower, tonight and tomorrow night, the Lyrid meteor showers, where uh, if you want to stay up till around midnight, you've got a chance of seeing some bright shooting stars coming flying in from outer space. And we'll also talk about the structure of the solar system and the whole of the universe uh, from the ideas of the ancient Greeks like Aristotle onwards to the latest thinking on cosmology dark matter, dark energy and the Big Bang. So that's going to be the whole of the course in a nutshell. And with that, I will uh, hand over now to our main speaker and